Okay, take two. Spoilers for We Only Find Them When They're Dead, numbers 1 through 5. What space, if not an infinite void of nothingness? I mean, sure. It's full of wonders. There are the stars and the solar systems around us, most of which can be found inside their respective galaxies and nebulas, whose forms supersede imagination. Yet, they're all so far apart. There's so much room between the many different beautiful things out there in space. To me, it's always felt empty. To traverse space is to traverse infinite darkness that knows no bounds. It feels like some eldritch horror, and it always will. Existential horror and cosmic horror go hand in hand. This fear of the unknown and what's out there sticks into the back of our minds just itching in our heads. It's the fear of always being unsettled, of things never seeming completely right. That's space to me. And that's space in the world Al Ewing and Simone de Mayo have created in their Boom series. We only find them when they're dead. God, that title is going to be absolutely trash for the YouTube algorithm. My thumbnail must look like a mess. Ewing, writer of Guardians of the Galaxy and Sword, and Simone de Mayo, artist of several Power Rangers books, have created something truly special. I've been lucky enough to jump on this early with the first volume. Admittedly though, I don't think I get what they're trying to say. We only find them when they're dead is strange and confounding to me. I mean, I understand the basic plot. A future occupation has humanity carving out the corpses of dead gods for resources and the desire for more from life. The moment the moment plot is easy to understand, don't get me wrong. What I don't understand is the underlying message. I reference existential horror not only because this series invokes it, but because it's giving me an existential crisis. There are dead gods floating through space. A dead god gives off ideas of death or the absence of faith, maybe even hope. But it's important to note that these gods don't resemble our usual ideas of gods enough to confidently convey that. The gods in this book are more like giants, titans even. They don't have any domain or clear symbolic meaning. Their main characters are not carving to the god of the sky or the harvest. They're just these gigantic human-like beings who people don't understand. I honestly don't get it, but I think that's okay. I'm not gonna pretend that I understand what Ewing's doing here. I don't understand whatever metaphor these gods stand for. I don't understand why Demio draws them in case in armor without any signal of their domain. And I don't understand what makes these beings gods. Demio, with his gorgeous anime-like art style, which is amazing, <laughs> makes the gods of this book larger than life. That much is a fact, but he doesn't make them unknowable, I guess? They're strangely human at a glance with how they look and how they die like us. After matching this art with Ewing's incredible philosophical dialogue, it all becomes unnerving to me. It's both a far cry from his work on Guardians of the Galaxy, and not. It reminds me of the early conflict with the newly reborn Greek gods and Star Lord being trapped in another universe. At the same time, it reflects nothing of the struggle of the Guardians who fought those gods. We only find them when they're dead is not a funny, bombastic adventure. It's a struggle for the meaning of life, it feels like. The moment I knew there was something missing, that something just wasn't clicking with me, is the philosophical question about whether a god can be both real and alive. Are they too much for the human mind to comprehend? It feels like it in this book. The existential horror stems from accepting that these beings are gods at all, and the gods somehow being dead. Ewing and Demio seem more interested in asking these questions than making the usual spacefaring book. There aren't going to be any real standout characters, which is far from different from both of their previous works. There are going to be standout moments and standout ideas behind the lines, but none of these characters really jumped out at me. I feel like I'm grasping a straw as comparing this to the Guardians of the Galaxy, if I'm being honest. Ewing's writing has real range, and that's impressive beyond any fault. Demio, on the other hand, is a clear tour de force. His art encapsulates me with every page, even as I don't understand what's going on. Ewing doesn't make any obvious effort to make any character's personality all that interesting. It's Demio's art that allows characters to pop off the page anyway. The worst thing about the book is likely the characters and how lacking they are in development. I mean, I guess it's only been five issues, but it's also been a full arc, so I feel like at least one of these characters should really stand out, and none of them really do to me. Their personal drama feels melodramatic and gets in the way of discovering the existence and the reason behind these dying gods. They feel almost insignificant beside what they're here to discover. I want to know more about the gods they only find out about when they're dead. This is a new and happy experience for me. 
I've learned to enjoy something without completely understanding it. Usually I tend to derail and dog on stuff that tries to be too highbrow for its own good. But I think I like this book because it's not condescending, and it's not up its own butt, that much I know. I don't know much else other than that it's beautiful and has me thinking. I still think about that first god the characters found. This dead deity just floating through space. It's a sight to behold, and another series under Boom Studios belt. I think Boom Studios are about to become my favorite publisher. What's your favorite series from Boom Studios right now? Check out their stuff. I'll be reviewing more for the site and the channel soon. Thank you for listening, and try to find more books like this before they're dead.